Hello and welcome back to Classic Books with Ostara and Lily back there. And today we are going to get into Infinity in the Mind, the Science and the Philosophy of the Infinite by Rudy Rucker. But just as always, I would like to remind you to please stay safe and healthy. Hit the notification, like, subscribe, comment below. We are into the section of Infinities in the Mindscape. Still in Chapter 1. In the last section, I discussed some of the ways in which as actual infinity, an actual infinity could physically arise. But there are things that are not physical. There are minds, thoughts, ideas, and forms. In this section, we will see if any of these familiar non-physical entities are actually infinite. Are actually infinite. In order to appreciate the section at hand, it is necessary to keep an open mind of the question of whether or not mind equals brain. For if one assumes a priori that a thought is nothing more than a certain biochemical configuration in a certain finite region of matter, then unless one has infinite divisibility of matter, it seems to follow automatically that infinite thoughts are impossible. To cast a few preliminary doubts on the hypothesis that brain equals mind, let me introduce, let me quickly raise a few questions. And what you thought yesterday is still part of your mind? Is what you thought yesterday still part of your mind? If you own and use an encyclopedia, are the facts in an encyclopedia part of your mind? Does a dream which you never remember really exist? How can you grasp a book as a whole, even though you only read it a word at a time? With the truth of mat mathematics and still, excuse me, exist in the un if the universe disappeared? Did the Pythagorean theorem, theorem exist before Pythagoras? It did, but they just, nobody knew it. It's like the tree that falls in the forest and no one's there. It's a good, definitely food for thought. If three people are the, see the same animal, we say the animal is real. What if three people see the same idea? I think of consciousness as a point, an eye that moves about in a sort of mental space. All thoughts are are uh, already there in this multidimensional space, which we might as well call the mindscape. Our bodies move about in the physical space called the universe. Our consciousness move about in the mental space called the mindscape. Just as we all share the same universe, we all share the same mindscape. For just as you can physically occupy the same position in the universe that anyone else does, you can, in principle, mentally occupy the same state of mind or position in the mindscape that anyone else does. It is, of course, difficult to show someone exactly how to see things your way, but all of, a mind, of a mankind's cultural her heritage attests that this is not impossible. Just as a rock is already in the universe, whether or not someone is handling it, an idea is already in the mindscape, whether or not someone is thinking it. A person who does mathematical research, writes stories, or meditates is an explorer of the mindscape, in much the same way that Armstrong, Livingstone, or Cousteau are explorers of the physical features of our universe. The rocks and the moon were there before the lunar module landed, and all the possible thoughts are already out there in the mindscape. The mind of an individual would seem to be analogous to the room to the neighborhood in which that person lives. One is never in touch with the whole universe through one's physical perceptions, and it is doubtful whether one's mind is ever able to fill the same entire mindscape. Our last analogy, note that there is always a certain region of physical space that only I can ordinarily know of, barring surgery. No one but me in a position to assess, is in a position to assess the physical conditions Containing within my stomach. In the same way, there is a certain part of the mindscape that only I can ordinarily know of, unless over me, when I think of my childhood, will always, excuse me, the feelings that pass over me when I think of my, I am, I am to be greatly favored by the muse. The feelings that pass over me when I think of my childhood will always remain private and inexpressible. Nevertheless, these almost ineffable feelings are paid part of the common mindscape. They are simply difficult for anyone else to get in. The point of all this is that just as the 
fin finiteness of our physical bodies does not imply that every physical object is finite. The finiteness of the number of cells in our brains does not mean that every mental object is finite. Well, are there any infinite minds, thoughts, ideas, or forms, or what have you in the mindscape? The most familiar candidate is the set N for all natural numbers. If I try to exhibit N, all I can really do is show you something like this. N equals 1, 2, 3. What the dot 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 stands for is something that is evident, yet basically express inexpressible. The idea, of course, is that oh, all the natural numbers are to be collected together into a whole. Each of them would seem to exist individually in the mindscape, and no one would suppose that the set consisting of exactly the natural numbers would be in the mindscape as well. One almost feels as if one can see it. And this was a figure right there. We might try to avoid the use of the dot 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 by saying something like this. N is the set that has the following property. 1 is in N, and for any number X that is in N, X plus 1 is in N as well. The trouble with this definition is that it does not uniquely sing, single out one particular set. If for one instance there were some infinitely large number I, and if N were the set consisting of all the numbers in, in N, and all the numbers of the form I plus N for some in N, then N would satisfy the property that for every X is N. X plus 1 is in N as well, but N would be difficult for men, different from N. We might try to get around this difficulty by saying that N is the s smallest set in the mindscape that has 1 in it, and that, ha and that has X plus 1 whenever it has X. But for reasons that I will begin to explain in the next section, the word mindscape cannot be meaningfully used in a definition. The concept of mindscape is too, va too vast to be represented by any word or symbol. If we try to avoid this difficulty by substituting some sort of finite description of the mental universe for the word mindscape, then we can get the same problem as before. By the classic word of the logician Thoralf Skolem, we know that for any finite description of N one might come up with, there will be a different set N that also satisfies the description. So it is quite literally true that what is really meant by the dot 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 is inexpressible. Some thinkers have taken this to mean that there is, after all, no unique end in the mindscape. This could be true, but one need not take, in, take this to mean that there are no infinite sets in the mindscape if there are many, many versions of the set of natural numbers, then there are many, many infinite sets. However, it is normally more desirable to assume that there is a simple unique end in the mindscape. Just it is as just as it is simpler to assume that there is only one universe instead of a whole slew of parallel worlds. I might note here that if time is indeed infinite, then just as we can indicate Earth by saying this planet, we would could indicate our end by saying the number of seconds left in this time. This is in fact what people do when they attempt to define end by saying N is what you get if you start with the one with one and keep adding ones forever. Okay, and then it shows, it looks like it's a map of the United States and it looks like what he's doing is paralleling it right there. So. Figure 27, that was figure 27. Okay, if infinite forms are actually out there in the mindscape, then maybe we can, by some strange trick of mental perspective and some of these forms, the philosopher Josiah Royce <clears throat> maintain that a person's mental image of his own mind must be infinite. His reason is that one's image of one's own mind is itself an item present in the mind. So the image includes an image that includes an image and so on. This infinite regress can be nicely visualized by imagining a United States in which a vast and fanatically accurate scale model of the country occupies most of the Midwest. The scale model being absolutely accurate includes a copy of the scale model, etc. This regress is occasionally used to make a striking label for a commercial product. 
The old can of pet milk, for instance, bore a picture of a can of pet milk, which bore a can of a can of pet milk, etc. In a physical situation, we would probably never actually be able to finish making such a label in all its infinite detail. But the, the, ugh, this is not to say that no such label or country plus scale model could exist. There would be no problem if matter were infinitely divisible. The scale is indeed circular, then everything is, in a sense, already an object of the nature. And so showing figure 28, you can see, we come to that. Here we go. There is certainly no reason why a non-physical mind should not be infinite. And Royce's point is, point is that if you believe that one of the things present in your mind is a perfect image of this mind and its contents, then your mind is infinite. One might try to avoid this conclusion by adopting a circular scale attitude and insisting that there is no difference between the mind and the mind's image of itself, so that the allegedly infinite set of thoughts, image of the, the mind, image of the image, image of the thought, image of the image of the image, it, is really the same as the set, mind, 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 which is just a, a set with one member. So basically, He's saying, and that's true, I believe to be true, your mind is infinite, but you've got to will it, you know, you've got to be part of making it infinite. There's no end of what pe people can accomplish if that's what they want, which is just a set with one member of mind. I would like to discuss this a bit more, but first let me formally introduce some of the p apparatus of set theory. In Cantor's word, a set is a many that allows itself to be thought of as one. As one, my eyes are a little, my allergies. A set, a set is a many that allows itself to be thought of as one. A set is usually given as a pair of curly brackets enclosing some description of the contents of the set. It is as easy as to think of the curly brackets as a thought balloon. Thus, excuse me. Thus, the set one two is the unity obtained by taking taking the multiplicity consisting of the numbers 1 and 2 and treating this multiplicity as a unity. That is, we can think of the set 1, 2 as being expressed by a thought balloon that has 1 in it and 2 in it. A particular interest is set theory. In set theory is the empty set, and this shows uh, what looks like zeros of the slash, there are a couple of them. It's the one obtained by taking together nothing if we write out oh, um, at the final, what that's called, the zero with the slash. In the ordinary way, we get, and then two parentheses, which I have all I have drawn in an empty thought below, and then the bigger 29 right there. This is empty thoughts. <laughs> Lots of, like some people, empty thoughts. Bigger 29. More and more complicated sets can be built up by using only the brackets and various arrangements. Thus, we have set the, and then just various amounts of parentheses depicted in figure, okay, that's the set thought, that's what it is, depicted in figure 28b, and we could equally well form thoughts, I think that's what he's saying, which we see, which is how the number three is usually represented in terms of pure sets, and so see figure 29, that's the empty thoughts that we just, I just showed you. Now, let's get back to the question of whether or not a mind that has a perfect self-image is infinite really to get down to the bare bones, say that we have a mind, a label with set M such as that, the only number of M is M, that is M equals M in the parentheses. Now if we change this equation by replacing the M on the right by M in the parentheses, then we get M equals M in the parentheses. If we could continue replacing M by M in the parentheses forever, we would wind up with M equals, and then this looks like, there, parentheses right there. This could actually be a def definition of an M whose only member is itself. And note that placing another pair of brackets around and those, I think that's the mind, empty thoughts there we're talking about, changes nothing. Plain Eng in English, M is the set whose only number is, the set whose only number member is. And figure 30 says, based on a drawing from Robert Crumb, your high tone comics and then it shows right there another. 
But if the only mem member of M is indeed M itself rather than a copy of M, then M really only has one element. It is just that if we try to describe this element by using brackets, we get an infinite description. We call thoughts like M self-representative, whether or not such an M is to be regarded as infinite depends on whether you experience the M subjectively in the way you experience your own mind or objectively as a feature of the mindscape that is to be precisely described in the language of set theory. Set theory is indeed the science of the mindscape. A set is the form of a possible thought. Set theory enables us to put various facts about the mindscape into one framework in the same way that the atomic theory of matter provides a framework in which the diverse physical and chemical qualities of matter can be simultaneously accommodated. For the same atomic theory of matter, such phenomena as melting and burning, rusting and freezing were regarded as qualitatively different. This is what we started here. Once a good atomic theory was developed, however, all these phenomena could be thought of in more or less the same way. The notion of set was consciously introduced only at the turn of the century. Before long, it became evident that all the objects that mathematicians discuss, functions, graphs, integrals, groups, spaces, relations, sequences, all can be represented as sets. One can go so far as to say that math Mathematics is the study of certain features of the universe of set theory. The universe of set theory is closely bound up with the mindscape. One can, perhaps, think of the former as a sort of blueprint of the latter. A set is obtained where, when we take a thought and abstract from it all the emotive content, keeping only the abstract relation, ra relational structure. A set is the form of a possible thought, so the question of whether or not there is any infinite entities in the mindscape is really equivalent to the question of whether or not there are any infinite sets. According to set theorists, there, there certainly are infinite sets. Indeed, there is to be an endless hierarchy of infinities, the set of natural numbers, the set of all sets of natural numbers, the set of all sets of sets of natural numbers, etc., each member of the sequence can be shown to be of an infinitely greater than that of the earlier members. In modern set theory, there is a whole field of study called large cardinals, whose specialists study a dizzying array of higher and higher infinities. But many mathematicians and philosophers do not go along with the set a theorist, the traditional finitist, viewpoint is still with us. According to the finitists, there's nothing that is infinite in heaven or on earth. Well, I disagree with that too. Those who assert that infinite sets of every size have a secure existence in the mindscape are actually called Platonists. I guess must be talking about Plato. This name is a bit inapt since Plato did not believe in infinity. I'm free reading that. I think that's a bit of a size of a secure existence. Yeah, it says Plato did not believe in infinity, but he did believe in the existence of ideas independent of thinkers. And it is for this aspect of this his thought that the Platonists are named. It is not likely that the Phinitist versus Platonic debate will ever be concluded. On the one hand, it is probably possible to meet the demands of a Phinitist who says that He'll believe in infinity only if he, he isn't shown in an infinite set right now, which is something you can't show somebody. On the other hand, the notion of infinite sets uh, sets appear to be appears to be logically consistent. So the Fernandes can never prove that infinite sets do not exist. I incline towards Platonism, but if you are stubborn enough, how can I possibly convince you that infinite things are real? All I can do, after all, is to make a finite number of marks on a finite number of sheets of paper. If you're truly committed to disbelief in the infinite, then you will not be satisfied by anything less than by simultaneously exhibiting each member of some infinite set. You can't really 
keep showing some of the infinite because it goes on and on and on and on. If they insist that it ends, well, they won't have enough time in their lifetime. And whenever I claim that I have done so, you will triumphantly point at the, and I know that sounds like an oxymoron, because, but the physical is, does die, but the spiritual doesn't, or the energy doesn't. And I have done so, you will triumphantly point at the finiteness of the number of marks and paper which I have really shown you. In pre-Cantorian times, Benedictists sometimes thought thought that they had proved the impossibility of actual the infinite sets. These proofs, however, were always fallacious. Such proofs usually deal with some particular property, P, of numbers that each natural number happens to enjoy. P, P might be the property of being odd or even, having an immediate pre predecessor, being the sum of finitely many units of being greater than any predecessor. The false proof that no infinite numbers can ex numbers exist that then takes the form Every number has property P. If X is an infinite number, then X cannot have property P. Therefore, no infinite numbers can exist. The fallacy of such a cir circular proof is that, in such a circular proof, is that when it is asserted that every number has, certain, has property P, it is being quietly assumed that anything that fails to have property P does not exist. But of course, one cannot assume that the infinite, infinite sets must have certain properties before one has ever looked at them. Galileo's paradox, for example, showed that an infinite set can be put into a one-to-one -one correspondence with a proper subset of itself. Had we assumed in advance that no set could be put into a one-to-one -one correspondence with a proper subset of itself, then we, then we would have to have had a proof that no infinite set can exist. But such an assumption is totally unwarranted. Indeed, to make such an assumption is essentially to assume in advance that every set is infinite, which does not make for a produ very productive debate. But are we quite sure that the infinitists will never come up with some valid proof that the notion of infinite sets is incoherent and fundamentally meaningless? A Platonist would answer that yes, he is sure that there is no inconsistency in the theory of infinite sets. He is sure of this because the theory is no question, and the theory in question is a description of certain features of the mindscape that anyone can see. But the finit finitist can still hope. There is a, there is a curious proof discovered by, Kurt, discovered by Kurt Godel in 1930 that the consistency of set theory cannot be Consistency of set theory cannot be finitely proved. The time will never come when the finite, finitist is absolutely forced to admit that it is safe to talk about infinite sets. In mathematics, no other subject has led to more polemics than the issue of the existence or non-existence of mathematical infinities. We will return to some of these polemics in the last chapter. For now, let us reprint Cantor's opening salvo in the modern phase of this age-old debate. The fear of infinite, of infinity, is a form of myopia that destroys the possibility of seeing the actual infinite, even though it is in a form, in the highest form, that has created and sustained us. And in its secondary transfinite forms, occurs will, forms occurs all around us and even Inhabits our minds. All they can think of is Nietzsche, going, you know, going mad. Strong words, but what does Cantor mean when he says that the highest form of infinity created us? Read on. But we are going to stop right there, actually. And I will get back into the absolute infinity in the next video of Woody Rucker's uh, Infinity in the Mind: The Science Philosophy of the Infinite. But if you enjoyed this video, please hit like, subscribe, comment below, hit that notification bell. And also stay tuned for more from Ostara and Lily. And we'll be getting into Les Miserables again too. Have a good day and stay safe and healthy.